Hello, so I'm Susanna Barbosa from Inesh Tech and Data.net, and I'll be moderating this session on, on artificial intelligence. So to give you a little bit of context about the session, this is, is in the of, on the context of emission uh, of improving monitoring of the environment and particularly the marine environment. And Air.net is a fundamental building block for that mission. So for those of you who have not heard yet about Air.net, Air.net is a computational infrastructure of Air Center that aims to facilitate the access to data, the access to advanced computing and also to data science. And so this discussion is very timely because we are actually now in the process of really developing and implementing Air.net. And I'm very happy to have here a very distinguished and diverse panel for discussion. Uh, so uh, each presenter will have to do a 10 minute uh, presentation. So we'll start. So I'll just give you the overview of the panel. First, Francisco Paco Dobles Reis from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain, and will speak about the activities of this very relevant computational infrastructure. Then we have Janice Nims from NOAA. She's an expert in meteorology and will speak about NOAA's applications of artificial intelligence. Alipio Josh from the University of Porto and Mac will talk about AI for the sea. Then Alexandre Evzukov from COF and UFR Chota Brazil will speak about use of AI and data science for environmental monitoring in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil. And finally, but not last but not least, Guido Cervone from, from Penn State, so it plays at home, will talk about immersion learning and how to use it for atmospheric correction. I think we do have a very nice panel we'll, we'll, and we'll have a lot to discuss. So keep with us and when following the session, you can put your question to the chat box in the live stream. We'll have a little bit of time for discussion, but afterwards we'll have a breakout room for further discussion. You'll see the link afterwards. So without further ado, we can start with Paco's presentation. So I'll ask you to keep for, with your 10 minutes. Paco, please. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Susanna. Um, so uh, let me go to the beginning of the presentation. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate in this, in this panel. Um, I work at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is in Barcelona. It's a, it's a, a research infrastructure of the uh, Spanish government and the, uh, the Catalan regional governments with further support of the, uh, uh, local, uh, one of the local universities, it's a Polytechnical University here. And uh, the, uh, one of the characteristics uh, for, uh, of the BSC, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, is uh, that it hosts uh, the largest supercomputer for research in Spain, and it's one of the uh, largest infrastructures of the European Union. Uh, we also uh, perform research ourselves and we have a very strong training program uh, that includes uh, pre PhDs and, uh, and uh, uh, the further training to technicians and, uh, and postdocs. Um, the uh, BSC is organized in several departments. We are around 700 people, but uh, one of the departments is the one I'm leading, is the Earth Sciences Department, and it deals with uh, problems of environmental modeling and forecasting using process-based models, but also increasingly so the, uh, uh, the case of artificial intelligence models. And uh, we, uh, we work uh, on modeling, but we also have a very strong service-oriented component that I would like to uh, uh, describe a bit uh, better uh, in, at the end of my presentation. Uh, probably one of the, uh, the things that I, I want to emphasize here is how important it is to have transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary teams, teams that uh, can uh, bring together people with, uh, for instance, uh, computer, computer sciences background and uh, physical sciences, mathematical sciences, but also biological and uh, uh, social sciences all together. And this is the kind of environment that we have in our department where we are around 120 people with, of uh, many different nationalities. Um, the, uh, uh, one of our expertise is on global climate modeling. We run global climate models that uh, not only reproduce the, uh, uh, the uh, different uh, components of the physical climate system, but uh, we, work increasingly on uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, aspects related to the uh, carbon fluxes and the, uh, the role of other 
biochemical species, species in the uh, in the ocean in particular. And uh, uh, for this, we use uh, our climate model at very high resolution. So one of our challenges is to make simulations at resolutions that uh, cannot be uh, uh, used in other institutions and uh, demonstrate what is the value of uh, supercomputing. Uh, problems uh, that we address with uh, our model and also take in, uh, into account the, uh, the advantages that the developments in artificial intelligence uh, bring in uh, are, for instance, the uh, uh, developing uh, and uh, fitting our models to, uh, uh, or having a better fit of our models to the observations in particular, this is a, an example of how we use it uh, to estimate the organic carbon sequestration in the ocean, using the observations from the biochemical Argo floats and uh, using Argo, a, a genetic algorithm to better fit the uh, biochemistry parameters in our model. Or for instance, we look into uh, a very interesting problem, which is the characterization of the twilight zone ecosystems and uh, how we can use artificial intelligence to uh, a better model and uh, to find a better relationship between the uh, uh, ecosystems uh, that are uh, in, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, twilight zone that migrate up and down in the ocean uh, with a daily cycle, but at the same time are related to some uh, environmental variables that we can predict with our uh, Earth system model. So somehow we are trying to uh, couple the, uh, uh, the uh, life in the ocean to uh, the uh, biochemistry and the physics in the, uh, in the ocean in our model. And uh, this is something that we try to do to provide, to uh, perform predictions with a few months and a few years into the future to cope with the requirements that we have identified in a number of users. We work on something that is uh, critical for the application of artificial intelligence methods that are uh, data-based methodologies, which is uh, the evaluation and quality control of the data that are publicly available. In particular, we develop the uh, evaluation and quality control of uh, uh, the uh, Copernicus Climate Change Service, which is one of the uh, uh, several services that the, Copernic the European Copernicus Program has uh, to uh, serve the, uh, the purposes of different sectors in, uh, in Europe and globally. And for instance, we work with uh, different ranges of uh, different types of data, uh, mainly in the atmosphere, but also increasingly uh, it's the case in the biosphere and in the uh, surface of the ocean. We're also working closely with the marine service to uh, have a common understanding of what evaluation and quality control uh, should be in environmental, uh, in, in environmental problems. And uh, we have also connections uh, with uh, the uh, North American community to uh, find uh, common solutions to these, these problem that is uh, unfortunately often in the background and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, well, underestimated in its complexity. Just to conclude, uh, I'd like uh, to mention that uh, the uh, BSC uh, as a service oriented uh, institution uh, is uh, working towards uh, the development of a service uh, that uh, is uh, aligned with the, uh, the, the requirements of Air Data Net uh, to provide uh, a platform to the uh, research community to have access to both the uh, uh, rich uh, data sets that we host at the BSC, where we have around 10 petabytes of public data sets uh, available for analysis, but also uh, to broker data sets that are open and freely available, uh, particularly now in Europe and also in other continents. And uh, to provide the computer services that uh, can uh, help uh, researchers and, uh, and also services to use artificial intelligence methods to explore the benefits of these data sets. And I think I'll leave it there. So uh, that was uh, eight minutes. So Susanna, the floor is back to you. Very good, Paco. Excellent overview of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Thank you so much. So now we can move to Janice Seen's presentation on, on Noah's implementation, please. Hi, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak on this panel today. My name is Jimmy Sims, and I work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here in the United States. 
And I want to give a highlight on how NOAA is using science and technology to accelerate innovation in the 21st century. And I will focus the presentation on our artificial intelligence applications across the agency. Next slide, please. Within NOAA, we have three uh, top priorities, and those are our weather model initiatives, blue economy, and space innovation. NOAA provides environmental monitoring um, and information and guidance actually from the bottom of the ocean floor all the way out to the sun. And so it takes a lot of different tools in order for us to be able to meet our scientific missions. Um, next slide, please. Within NOAA, um, this past year, we have been releasing new science and technology strategies. These strategies include uncrewed systems, which was formerly named unmanned systems, uh, artificial intelligence, omics, which is actually the, the different methodologies for understanding um, the DNA and proteins of the animal species within our oceans, um, cloud computing, data, and also citizen science. And so these uh, six science and technology strategies really have a lot of interdependencies. Um, and we definitely want to make sure that we are providing the synergy across our agency in order to serve the public. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, I will be focusing on our applications of artificial intelligence. And NOAA has actually served as a global leader in AI um, for over 25 years now. Um, we began using artificial intelligence in order to support data assimilation um, with satellites into our weather models. And we continue to do so now. Um, however, NOAA is broken up into five main line offices. And so sometimes we categorize the different line offices on the dry side, which is more so focused on weather and our data, particularly our satellite data and information. And then we have the wet side, which is more so focused on our ocean and fisheries needs. And so what we're seeing now within NOAA is really and truly that broad use of artificial intelligence. And we have determined that we have approximately 200 projects currently um, that are using AI applications. And so it's extremely important for us to coordinate that um, across the board and make sure that we are developing partnerships as well in order for us to um, take full advantage of the resources that we have for artificial intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. Within our AI strategy, we have five strategic uh, goals. And in the first goal, one of the main things that we look to do is to establish the NOAA Center for Artificial Intelligence. This will be a center that will facilitate a lot of our um, partnerships that we look to develop. It will also provide training opportunities and be that catalyst in order to um, fully coordinate and determine the resources um, across the agency that, that we will use in order to advance our uh, science and technology areas. Um, something that I didn't say in the previous slides is that we really look to um, the data strategy as well as cloud computing and AI as the foundation of all of these strategies because there's so much um, that those three strategies provide that are useful for the other strategies as well. Additionally, um, I did want to highlight that we really look to advance research and development um, and putting these applications into operations. Um, we are also looking to train our future workforce in the areas of artificial intelligence as well. So that is a brief summary of what our strategic goals are. Next slide. Just to give you a few examples of how we're using um, AI across NOAA, we of course use it for data quality control, even fishery surveys, monitor, model, I'm sorry, model parameterization, um, automated weather warning, ocean robotics, environmental mapping, and hazard detection. And we're giving some examples here. Um, just to show you the benefits of using AI. As I mentioned, we collect um, a lot of data on a daily basis in order for us to do our jobs. And actually simulating that data into our models, of course, takes a lot of computer resources. And what we're showing in the center image is how we were able to um, 
to take information from our radiative uh, transfer model and actually reduce the compute time for, uh, for the data assimilation of the JPSS um, algorithms, we were able to reduce the compute time from 1.3 hours to one second. And that alone shows you how we're able to reduce the, the cost just using AI algorithms. Additionally, we use AI also uh, to support imagery and rip current detection, um, as you can see here on the right side of the screen, where our National Ocean Service and National Weather Service are partnering to use AI algorithms in order to better detect the rip currents and put out warnings um, that are extremely important for saving lives. Next slide. Just to give you another example for our products and services, um, you know, it's extremely important that we not only provide information to warn the public on, you know, what severe weather or other natural disasters are heading their way, but it's also important for us to know what's not coming. And so we want to make sure that we are reducing false alarms. And this is just an example of how we've been able to do that um, with our ensemble modeling and the use of AI. And so what you're seeing here is that um, in, in the images on the left side, you can see that, um, that the, the imagery may not be as smooth and, and as accurate as we want it to be. But then with the use of, of AI, we are able to make sure that we are reducing um, that, that false alarm rate in order to produce the best and most accurate um, forecast. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I also wanted to talk about how we're using AI for um, our blue economy uh, initiatives. And within NOAA, of course, we have several mandates um, from the US government that, that actually support a lot of the work that it is that we do with our ocean mapping and exploration. And of course, you know, we're looking to um, provide coastal information to, to save lives, but we also um, discover new species within our oceans, and we also provide information for uh, fisheries. So these are just a few images um, from the use of uncrewed systems, as well as our shipping um, that we use to collect data. Next slide. For the ocean mapping, this is just an example of how we use machine learning um, for our data analysis, particularly for um, not just the ocean mapping, but even for the fishery surveys. You know, we've been able to reduce our data processing time from um, by 98%, you know, there would be um, images that would come back that because of the large amount of data that we would receive, it could take months um, in order to analyze all of that data. And we've been able to reduce that time um, in order to put the information out much faster um, to meet our mission and goals. Next slide. So this is one of our uncrewed um, systems and, and robotics that we, that we use in order to actually um, explore the ocean. Um, we've been able to, again, determine new species, but also better understand um, what's happening within our oceans and how it's changing. Um, even when we talk about supporting uh, hurricane and tropical storm uh, forecast, we're able to um, get new information about the temperatures of the ocean and how it's changing um, so that we can, again, provide the best forecast to save lives. And we look to even further improve our tracking and intensity forecast. Um, if you notice over the past uh, several years, we have been doing wonderful um, with, with really pinpointing where these storms will land that actually impact our coastal areas. And you can quickly go through the next slide. Um, it's just images. I know that my time is almost up. <laughs> um, I did want to talk about how um, we are looking to further expand our partnerships, not just for ocean exploration, but across the board um, within NOAA with our science and technology strategies. Um, so I'd be happy to speak with anyone further about that. Next slide. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much, Denise. Very nice presentation. And I think now we can move to Alipio. Are you ready, Alipio? 
Yes. Can uh, you hear me? Can you, can you share your presentation, please? So uh, you want me to share? Yes, please. Okay. Let me just put it in presentation mode. This is okay. Sorry. Okay, this is the beginning. So, um, hello everyone. So, my name is Alipio. Um, I'm very happy to be here in this uh, uh, panel um, about artificial intelligence. So, I've been working in uh, artificial intelligence for for many years. I mm, basically work in algorithmic uh, and I'm I have a more computer science and algorithmic view of artificial intelligence so I'm not by any means um, experienced in the application of artificial intelligence in this domain of the sea and uh, in uh, in general to atmospheric uh, phenomena etc so what I present here is a short reflection from my point of view what of what are the the, the the problems that can be that are being approached uh, in general and with AI in particular. And then I, I, make, I try to make a link with some of the um, trends in artificial intelligence that uh, some of you have already mentioned, Jamie's and Francisco have already mentioned some, some uh, uh, interesting challenges and, and, and uh, points for solutions. So I come from the Inesc Tech and the University of Porto. Um, and uh, so my reflection starts with where where can I AI help in this domain? So um, it's obvious that we have here, as in many other uh, areas, lots of data. But it's it's also important to 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 uh, gather not only data but also knowledge that can be useful by um, for artificial intelligence methods. Not so much the current methods, which are very much based on on uh, data crunching uh, and rely on, on, uh, on uh, big data um, and, and uh, machine learning and sensory machine learning, but also uh, methods that uh, are also emerging that combine data with other kinds of knowledge. So uh, some examples of, of, um, of uh, tasks that uh, were also mentioned here, for example, species count and identification for ecosystem monitoring, uh, also for sustainable fishing or sustainable mining and deep sea exploration. So this is something that is, is being done uh, in, uh, in other uh, areas, not other natural areas uh, like the rainforest where you, you can, for example, use sounds in the case of rainforest to, to count species to do monitoring using artificial intelligence. And this is uh, certainly one uh, very good example of application uh, for AI in the, um, uh, in the sea. So there are other uh, important issues like uh, cleaning the sea uh, with respect to plastic and other, um, other materials and uh, pollutants um, and climate change for monitoring and for uh, now casting of what is happening in the sea and also for forecasting. Uh, and safety in general with navigation, deep sea exploration, um, extreme weather and seismic activity, and even crime. So there, there are many uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, now I move to what can AI bring to, to face this? So AI already has um, very uh, effective techniques that uh, have been um, popularized in the, in the last 10 years mostly related mostly to, to deep learning, but not only. Um, but there are some uh, challenges that we still have to overcome. So it is hard to collect data um, and uh, autonomous underwater vehicles uh, as the one shown by, by Jamie's and remote sensing can help uh, uh, collecting these data. And AI can also help in collecting the data because um, data collection can also be a, um, a hard task um, in, in rough uh, territories, like typically we have with the sea in rough environments. Uh, reinforcement learning is, is already being used for uh, autonomous vehicles and is very important also for data collection in the, in the, in the ocean. 
um, self-aware system. So self-awareness is something that is is being already approached in in some AI systems, um, and, and this requires coupling uh, machine learning approaches with um, reasoning approaches and knowledge representation approaches that can give the the, the data collection agents. Um, uh, the ability to understand where they are and what they what is what are the goals and how they can be achieved. So, in particular, with multi-agent systems, which are uh, these days um, a bit outdated, so they, they need uh, also to be uh, revamped and recoupled with uh, modern machine learning uh, technologies, and they are already being. Uh, done in um, approached uh, like that by by some researchers. So a, a very important problem with the artificial intelligence that we face these days. We have lots of data, but sometimes we don't have labeled data, or we would, we don't have the feedback. So the data needs a lot of labeling, and there are also important um, advances in this respect and the important challenges with few short learning, with transfer learning, which is more natural with with deep learning approaches. But uh, it's, it's an area that can be uh, developed uh, further in order to reduce the need for labeling of data. Also, data augmentation, which uh, has been done in, in, um, in images, but is, is, it's, is a technique that is also uh, now being extended to other types of data that are not so naturally prone to, to data augmentation, as it is the case, for example, of, of uh, textual data. And textual data is not a very important data for for sea exploration, but uh, it is also to, to important to to uh, explore the the knowledge that we have in text about the sea, and also the human in the loop, uh, which is also a trend to have of artificial intelligence from data collection to evaluation, and uh, here the, the techniques of uh, active learning are. Alipius, can you hear us? So I guess you lose the Lipius connection. So maybe we can we can go forward and the Lipi will join again. Ah, here you are. Okay, sorry. Um, my connection went down and up. Um, so I was talking about automatic machine learning, which is an important area, also an important trend. Um, and also, uh, if we want to learn about what machine learning is, 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 is doing and artificial intelligence is doing, um, not only for safety reasons, but also for the need of transmitting the, the knowledge that is acquired, we need explainable AI, uh, discovery of causality, uh, and also natural language language generation for generating reports automatically uh, to communicate with humans that can benefit from the, from the knowledge. Um, and one uh, important thing uh, that uh, is, is very important in, in, in a system like the C is how can AI model in a complex system? So this is a very, very big challenge. We have approaches these days like digital twins, mostly in industry, but um, this kind of uh, simulation approach coupled with the theoretical knowledge and the theoretical um, um, formalization of systems using, for example, differential equations also can be uh, coupled with the data-driven approaches uh, brought by AI and machine learning. And this is a, a big challenge because this in implies having um, systems working together and approaches working together uh, which is something that these days we're not doing so much. So we, we tend to focus on a specific problem and propose a specific solution. So things like science automation, there's a, a very old uh, approach of the robot scientist by, um, uh, by, by uh, Professor Ross, which is, is a very interesting uh, Autom automation uh, approach for, for science discovery. 
also understanding the underlying logic of the system, not only um, making the connection between symbols, but understanding the underlying logic, which is something, uh, a very important challenge. Learn from literature and databases and bring this knowledge uh, and couple it with, with, um, with the data. Uh, model common sense and scientific knowledge and again also argue with humans use a human AI blackboard system so that uh, AI can learn with humans and humans can learn with AI. Alipo, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you please reshare your screen? We lost it when your uh, signal went oh, away. Sure, Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that was the, the last uh, the, the last slide. I didn't realize you were not. Okay, so it's reshared, but I, I finished anyway. I don't, if you, if you have some, if you missed something I can repeat, but I'm not sure if it is necessary. Okay, thank you, Alipio. I think we can, we can move on and then okay, we'll have you. time for, for discussions. Thank you so yes, much. Thank you. So we can now move on with Alexandre Tsukov from Brazil that will speak about AI for environmental monitoring. Please Alexandre, thank you. Hey, thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, my name is Alexandre Tsukov. Uh, thank you for the invitation for this panel. It's my first time in the recent summit. And I came from uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. We are at the Graduate School of uh, Engineering, and we we are at uh, uh, computational engineering and science in a disciplinary area, and uh, we have been working uh, with uh, data science and artificial intelligence in different applications. And here uh, I'll try to uh, show uh, some mostly two of our projects. Uh, directly related to uh, the monitoring, environmental monitoring, and focus in the Rio de Janeiro area. So, uh, just to start, just recalling this uh, uh, nice work from uh, Bettencourt uh, some 10 years ago that talks about the scaling of cities. Um, and we know that uh, uh, there are uh, very some parameters that grow in super linear scale in, in cities and cities grow very fast. And there are some, uh, this uh, sometimes that you have some innovation and then uh, this can disrupt this, uh, this uh, trajectory of growth. And by the time we have seen that these, uh, these cycles of innovation have been each time shorter and the challenge as well has been uh, very, very more, very more important, and I think that uh, uh, artificial intelligence and data science can be uh, tools uh, to solve uh, some of those problems. And we are just talking about some of this example here uh, in application of Rio de Janeiro. So this is a Rio de Janeiro uh, map. Uh, we are located in the southeast of Brazil. Uh, we have here the Guanabara Bay, that is uh, a very large bay, the uh, third largest bay in Brazil, but it's very important economically. And this map shows the growth of the city in the 20th century, uh, where the light areas is the beginning, the end of the 19th century, and the dark areas is how the city grows uh, on time. Um, and we have a very rapid growth uh, the population of the city has grown for 10 times in the 20 scales. And this uh, obviously has uh, brought uh, many, many problems. Other problems, other uh, issues is that uh, you can see here that you have these areas, is that the city is, um, a, there are a lot of hills and mountains in the middle of the city. And this is, has a per very particular geography of Rio de Janeiro that uh, you have the coast and the mountains in the same place. So we have this project that uh, used uh, mobile phones to identify the mobility patterns in Rio de Janeiro. 
So here you see the uh, here Janeiro metropolitan area, and each uh, Voronoi poly polygon represents the area of one uh, antenna. Uh, this uh, region in blue is the city of the Rio de Janeiro, and the other are the other municipalities. We have 23 municipalities and two mi 12 million inhabitants, and we process a 2 billion records of uh, almost 3 million subscribers. So uh, we uh, so this uh, this figure show the pace of the city. Uh, how are the uh, people? Uh, where are the people across the time? So uh, this region is the most dense populated region of the, the city. You see that they are uh, very near to the coast. So the city has a very very. Uh, close relation with the sea and the coast. So here are some of the results. We show that we have the main uh, uh, mobility patterns across these regions that are more densely population, but you had also very important uh, passes to the east and to the west and to the north, uh, as uh, most of the people that live in the suburbs come to work in the downtown in the city. So here you have the two main patterns, the homework pattern that is very stable. Everybody goes uh, to, the, uh, to the work and come back to home uh, in the weekend. So we have not uh, uh, too much mobility. And the other hand, you have the other pattern that is the trip uh, in weekend. Then uh, people go uh, to travel in the weekend. So it's, uh, it's low during the weekend, uh, more intense in the, in the end of the week. So then we, we showed that we can, the mobility, we can identify some, uh, some socioeconomical uh, uh, characteristics of the, the, the region only by regarding the mobility. So Rio de Janeiro has also some particular uh, uh, geography that you have uh, low-income people that live very near to high-income people, so the so-called favelas. And so we see that uh, if you have uh, a place that is visited for a lot of people and you have a, a different origin, uh, if, when you measure this by entropy, it's right, highly correlated with the, the number of jobs and the income of the relation, such that looking by mobility only, we can infer the social, social economic status of the region. So it uh, correlates very well uh, to the other index that are common currently used. So other projects that we are working is related to more related to artificial intelligence. So floods is a very pro very important problem for, for us in Rio de Janeiro, and they uh, cause uh, uh, damages and uh, life loss and has uh, many other problems. So it's very important for us to have no casting of uh, severe weather. So uh, we have applied uh, artificial intelligence, uh, mostly uh, deep learning network or video prediction uh, or for no casting precipitation. We use it radar uh, data information. So this is not here, this is uh, Sao Paulo data set, but um, we can show that uh, we can more or less correctly predict uh, the evolution of the, the system. But the problem is that uh, you can see that the prediction becomes a little bit blur as the time prediction horizon uh, uh, increases. And you see that when you have a 30 minute forecast, you have better results than 60 minute forecast. So the conclusion is that uh, that was already pointed out in, in the paper that uh, has. Uh, come out in nature uh, last year, that artificial intelligence alone is not, uh, uh, not enough to, to deal with very complex air science problems. So uh, the next step in this research is to join uh, other models, numerical and meteorological models with uh, this artificial intelligence so that you can uh, profit of the, the capacity of the two kinds of models. Uh, the artificial intelligence model and the, the numerical modeling model. So uh, 
So we have this project that is called Bahia Viva, that is, uh, uh, as you know, Rio de Janeiro is one node of the F Center uh, network. So this is a, a, a database that uh, has been collected that uh, uh, include radar, remote sensing, uh, in situ data, and also uh, model results, forecast, and socioeconomic data. So we are already doing some forecasts using numerical models. And now the idea is to integrate those numerical no models with uh, artificial intelligence uh, and modeling uh, to get better, uh, uh, more accurate results. And as said, uh, uh, for uh, reduce uh, the false, false alarm rate and also to have uh, predictions in, in good time. So, uh, so we are in this continuing project that will uh, have also been impacted by the pandemics. Uh, and so we would like to integrate in the same database uh, different time, types of data, such as oceanographic data, mobility data, remote sensing data, and so on, uh, also with socioeconomic data. And um, this uh, will have uh, atmospheric modeling, epidemic modeling, and artificial intelligence. We try to do this uh, in an integrated uh, way uh, to have uh, different products, such as vulnerability maps, uh, epidemic scenario, weather forecasts, epidemic monitoring, and, and other kind of products that can uh, be offered to the government and to the society. So this has been developed in our lab at Coffee, and uh, we also, the, the previous projects that have uh, been shown all have uh, open uh, data, uh, and we interact with all the other important institutes in Rio de Janeiro, that is Rio Cruz, uh, LNCC, and uh, FGD, and this project has been supported by the um, Rio de Janeiro State Council, Research Council, that is Papers. So, I uh, hope that we in time. Thank you very much. So, I'll be glad to, to answer your questions. Thank you, Alessandro. So, we now move on to, to our next panelist, the final panelist, Guido Cervoni. Guido, please. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and here we go. Um, does it work? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. Sorry, I cannot see the video because I'm on full screen mode. So uh, my name is Guido Cervone. I am um, Associate Director for the Institute for Computational and Data Science at Penn State. I'm also a professor in the Department of Geography and I have a courtesy appointment in Meteorology and Atmospheric Science. Um, I'm going to talk today about a methodology to use machine learning in order to improve atmosp the atmospheric characterization, which in turn gives us a better assessment of what is on the ground. So what is on the ground or also what is on the air, uh, basically for target detection in order to understand what we're looking at. Um, just a few seconds about me. Um, I'm a computer scientist by training. I started doing machine learning in the early 2000s. So uh, before it was uh, very popular, my specialty was with symbolic machine learning. Uh, what today we uh, very often tend to describe as explainable AI. Um, and then, you know, I started venturing into the more of the statistical methodology. And then for the last few years, I ventured into deep learning, which is what this presentation is about. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues, Dr. Mark Salvador and uh, my uh, PhD student, uh, Dr. Fan Sao Su, uh, who work on this project with me. So, the, uh, the biggest problem in image spectroscopy, uh, also called um, hyperspectral remote sensing, is um, to characterize a specific signal that we are looking, uh, we're looking for. Now, um, in general, when we look at uh, the world using remote sensing instruments, whether they're airborne or spaceborne, uh, we can do it 
uh, either looking one channel at a time, the panchromatic, which would just be the brightness, tends to be over the uh, visible part of the spectrum, or multispectral, uh, in which we have several bands which are spread throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, or with hyperspectral, where we take an entire electromagnetic spectrum and we divide it into many, many, many narrow bands. Uh, the advantage of hyperspectral is that we can have a very precise um, uh, spectral signature for uh, whatever object we're looking at. The disadvantage is that uh, one, it's harder to uh, build the instrument. And second, uh, because the bands are so narrow, the atmospheric correction becomes really paramount. In target detection, what we're trying to do is to recognize some targets observed using remote sensors. Uh, we do that using shape and texture, but also the spectral signature. Um, me, in particular, I'm interested in full spectrum uh, image spectroscopy. What I mean full spectrum, um, really from the visible all the way into the long wave um, infrared. There is uh, some hyperspectral that is done in the ultraviolet, uh, but that is um, not much of interest for this particular research, uh, neither so much in the visible. Um, so we're really trying to target the show wave infrared all the way into the long wave infrared. And what my uh, research tries to focus on is on hard to detect targets. And we will define those in just a minute. So um, a few words about uh, target detection. So it's operationally used. It's something that, you know, as we speak is being um, utilized. Um, it is uh, the primary goal is to identify materials using remote sensing observations. It is based on very sound physics, mathematics, and statistics, all methodology primarily developed in the 90s. Uh, and what we can say that today's solutions, they lag behind the revolution in computational power and artificial intelligence, and also our ability to collect data using agile sensors and platforms. Our current solution have many simplifying assumptions or experience. We know that those solutions are fast, uh, but they also introduce errors. And the most significant error is the atmospheric correction. So we say in remote sensing, we're either looking at the atmosphere or we're looking through the atmosphere. So no matter what our target is, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, we do have to very precisely characterize the atmosphere. The state of the science, it is effective in performing identification in what we call optimal conditions. However, we do know that it fails in the non-optical condition. For example, when we have clouds, when there are shadows, where we have a mixture of materials. For example, uh, when we have, you know, like a liquid that spills over solid. Now, one of the biggest problem with today's solution is that when they fail, and we do know that they fail in those non-optimal conditions, often they do so without any level of uncertainty. So in other words, uh, when the algorithm fails, we really cannot tell much at the, the answer. And this is like a big problem for real-time decision-making. So target detection process follows this particular um, flowchart where we acquire data. And, you know, usually it's either from space or from, air, from an airplane. We have a sensor that collects data over a geographical area. First, the sensor is calibrated, so that sensor itself has to be adjusted for the real-world uh, collections, which might include atmospheric characteristics, uh, but also things like temperature of the sensor and ambient temperature if you're looking in the long wave part of the spectrum. And then we have, you know, the red box. This is, you know, what I do, what I am interested in, to take the data that were collected and correct them for the background so that, you know, uh, if there were any contamination of pixel from other sources, uh, this is filtered. And of course, the atmosphere, as we said. So the, the real goal is to go from the collection from the airplane to, what, to this data cube, where the X and Y are the longitude and the latitude, and the vertical axis, the lambda, is the spectral signature from those targets once we correct them from any potential background uh, and the atmosphere itself. And once we do that, see for every pixel we have, you know, uh, spectral signatures, then we can compare those with databases where we have uh, spectral signature from different objects. 
And once we do that, we can identify the object and we can do so with certainty. Now, the biggest problem is to solve this equation, also called the uh, radiance equation. And uh, it looks pretty scary. I remember the first time I saw it, I thought it was very scary. But then as you analyze it, um, it's actually not too bad. Uh, we have um, uh, what here on the left is the total radiance that is measured at the sensor. And then we have a linear combination of components. Uh, the first one is a solar component. And there is the angle between the sun and the object that we're trying to, to study. Tau 1 is the atmospheric component from the sun, so from the top of the atmosphere to the target, times the reflectance of the object. This one is the self-emissivity of the object, where alpha, LT lambda is the black body radiation multiplied by um, the emissivity. Um, then we have the downwelling component of the atmosphere. So basically, this is uh, scattered or reflected energy from, by the atmosphere into the target. And then we have uh, the background. So this is, um, see there is a component F1 minus F. This is the downwelling component. That is because of um, the atmosphere into the target. This is from a background radiation into the target. And everything gets multiplied by tau 2, which is the atmosphere from the target to our sensor. And of course, tau 1 and tau 2 are related, but they're different because the angle, the geometry of collection between the sun, the target, and the sensor, they differ. Furthermore, usually, tau 1 is from the top of the atmosphere all the way to the target. Um, so the irradiance comes from the sun. So he has to traverse all the atmosphere, whereas tau 2, it's usually lower because the sensor, uh, unless it's a spaceboard sensor, then it flies um, below the top of the atmosphere. And finally, the last component is the upwelling. So what the, from the atmosphere goes directly into our sensor without ever hitting our target. So Guido, that's uh, Guido uh, sorry, yes. you, you have one minute. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be done. Um, and uh, the atmospheric correction, um, the current solution, we try to run a model. And each model, every uh, what we call every image is an, an island. Every image is an, uh, analyzed independently. And what we're trying to do, the proposed new solution, is to use a machine learning model. So what we're really trying to do is, you can see here, we have our total radiance. We run it through the machine learning model, and we automatically identify our four different components for our solution. Um, once we have those, we just simple algebra and we can identify our reflectivity. This is the architecture of the model. It is a simple deep learning neural network where in the, uh, the input is our total radiance as a function of angles. So we look at a target at different angles and the output is our transmission on welding and scattering. And I will just show one last figure in which I can show the reconstruction. This is a real reconstruction that we have made using uh, real data. Uh, so this is not simulated data, it's real data. And the blue line is uh, the target signature for our object from seven and a half micron to 12. And what you can see here in the box plot is our reconstructed target sig signal. And the box plot gives us a measure of uncertainty. And I'm done. So thank you, Guido, and, and thank you to all the panelists for excellent presentations. Uh, we have some time now for questions and answers and discussion. I think that um, while we still don't have questions from the audience, and I strongly encourage the audience to, to make questions through the chat box on the live stream, uh, I, I don't resist to kind of make a, a provocative question to the panel, and, and I would like to hear your thoughts. So Alip, you told very well that artificial intelligence is not only data, of course, but it's a lot. You need data for it. We have never, we never had so much data available, although we always complain we don't have data, and that's true. But how can we best use the data that we have so far? And, and specifically, how can Air Data Net best serve the, the partners in terms of facilitating the access to data? Would it be to having through regional data cubes 
a numerical model tuned to, to the Atlantic uh, with a finer resolution, for example? Would it be with more in situ data? What would be your thoughts about this? I don't know, maybe Paco could start. Uh, what would be the, the data to kickstart the AirDataNet? Okay, I, I can I can start, but I'm I'm sure that Jamie's will will have very good insights on the issue because NOAA is a very it's a uh, it's a very intense uh, data collector. So in, in our my response might not be uh, very useful to you because uh, I, I would say that it depends. It depends on the question. It depends on who you want to help with your data analysis. So saying that uh, we don't have enough data. Uh, is an ill-posed question because uh, we might not have enough data for a certain purpose. Um, so at, at times we, uh, we we tend to look at this problem from uh, a research point of view, which is a very valid uh, view and uh, of of, uh, of the challenges that we have to address in terms of knowledge and data available. But uh, at, in, in my department, we like to look at uh, problems from a user perspective. So, uh, and uh, the, 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 real, the really interesting uh, part of uh, the research that we, we do, and we are very close to uh, using big machines and really justifying the, the, the big investments that go into them. But uh, somehow uh, we, uh, we, are, uh, we are pushed by our government to illustrate how those investments in big machines and uh, in data collection and uh, data management can benefit society. So if, if we take, for instance, uh, a, a question like uh, what I was mentioning before, so what to do with uh, the, uh, the, uh, all the uh, uh, ecosystems that are in the twilight zone, uh, which is largely, largely unknown. Uh, we, we start uh, knowing uh, what, what happens uh, now in, uh, in this uh, area between 100 and 1,000 meters in the, in the, in the ocean and uh, what lives there and what we can do with it. But uh, then the, the question is different and the data that you need is different. If uh, you try to look in, uh, at understanding the, uh, the identification of those ecosystems and the relationships be between them and also with the predators that, that, are, uh, uh, that, uh, st that live in, in uh, the upper part of the ocean. Um, and uh, the perspective that a policymaker might uh, might uh, have concerning that problem, which is the uh, profitability of the twilight zone and those ecosystems. So the data needed for each one of these, uh, the, for the questions that uh, the scientist and the policymaker will uh, will will make, uh, might be very different. And uh, somehow we 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 tend to respond as scientists, which is all very good, and we are we never have enough data. But for uh, a policymaker, the response might lie. In, uh, uh, in, in something that we can do with the existing data that we have now. So somehow uh, there are lots of answers that we can provide uh, and uh, for sure operational institutions like NOAA uh, are doing this very often, but somehow uh, in both NOAA and, and ourselves, we lack a bit of connection with the academic uh, community to make the most of all the knowledge that is being generated to make a useful uh, uh, use of the of the existing data. Of course, we need more data, more sensors, and, uh, and a better uh, coverage of the of the uh, of the uh, of the climate system and the Earth system. But uh, I, I think the, the the response is is quite long and uh, it's it's complex. But uh, it, it's it wasn't a simple question. <laughs> No, not at all. I guess Janice Noah also has a very strong focus on the user, right? On the exactly. needs. Definitely, we do. And, you know, as I mentioned, when it comes to the amount of data that we collect, I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of data um, that we have within NOAA, because again, we are monitoring everything from the ocean floor to the sun. And we do actually apply um, AI to to all those focus areas, you know, that we have. Um, I think one of the greatest challenges, which was just mentioned, is making sure that our data is is AI ready, you know, and and making sure that we can actually um, use that data 
um, very quickly uh, for artificial intelligence, for quality control, you know, um, making sure that the way that we collect data is, is most efficient um, in order for us to rapidly use it, especially with our agency being an operational um, agency. We are extremely customer focused because we want to make sure that, you know, we are providing information for decision makers, first and foremost, um, being a government agency. Um, but we, we also want to make sure that we have the right partners that can really drive that data innovation. And that's what our strategies, you know, are looking to do. Um, as I mentioned, the, the NOAA Center for Artificial Intelligence, of which we are um, developing right now is looking to, you know, create that repository of, of AI ready data and also make sure that we have standards um, in place so that we're using trustworthy um, AI as well. And so, you know, there is a need for us to continue our partnerships um, with the academic institutions that, that we have uh, uh, grants and partnerships with right now, but we do also look to build um, you know, future partnerships as well. But again, the, the large amount of data that we have, we just want to make sure that we are using it most efficiently. And that's where AI is able to, to assist. I take your, your, your cue on partnerships to, to, to maybe ask another provocative question, I, maybe, we, we have some kind of gap between the people that are able to use AI. So like Guido as expert, is expert in machine learning and in artificial intelligence or LPU. And then the researchers that have very practical problems and that know the domain, the data, the application. And how could, do you think it's, it's can we bridge that gap? Is through training, through how, how can you make the artificial intelligence world, more computational, the computational side, infrastructure side, and the researcher or the not only the researcher, someone who has responsibilities for managing uh, some area in the country, the sea, the fishes, how can we bridge that gap and, and combine the two worlds? I don't know who dares to, to make some comments on this, Alipio, Guido. Sorry, the connection was a little bit broken, so I didn't fully understand. I'm, I'm, so I, I understood, you know, the first part we said, you know, the connection between, you know, the general methodology and applications, but I didn't hear the, the second part. I apologize. So how, how do you think you can bridge the, the two worlds? The more uh, the, the AI world more focus on the computational and then the, the environmental monitoring side, the people that really know about the data and the problems, but really don't know how to use AI. Okay, yeah, it, it, I, I hope you can hear me because my connection breaks every now and then, but if I understand correctly, you're asking how to bridge the world. You know, one, it is a very computational world of the people that do the algorithms and the analysis, and the other is the world of the people that are actually in the field collecting the experiments or planning for the experiments. That, that's a very good uh, question. And, you know, I really think that the answer is interdisciplinary collaborations. You know, we, um, I think, you know, little uh, publicity for Penn State, I think, you know, we do this particularly well, but I really think that this is the future of science. You know, we're no longer living those silos that, you know, they develop isolated, where um, environmental scientists, they just worry about the environment and then, you know, they will partner later on with someone who can do the analysis. It's something that you know, really goes from early on. We need to add this in our curricula for our students so that uh, there is an understanding of what machine learning, AI, statistics, and all other computational algorithms can do as far as supercomputing capabilities like the Barcelona supercomputing capabilities so that the environmental scientists are aware of what is available and then later on you know the partnership are built and then you know the teams are created but i really think that um those two words they cannot evolve independently there must be cooperation and you know this really starts at the level of education when we educate the next generation scientists we need to put this into our curriculum very well Ali, do you want to comment yeah, I don't have much to add to what uh, Guido just said. I uh, fully agree. So one one important thing is is education. So if if we have training programs that bring together these specialities and we and we uh, have uh, new specialists that are 
able to do these things together, then we are better off. That's happening these days with the, for example, computational biology. So we, they, which are quite popular, or, or bioengineering, or, or um, biomedical engineering. So the the same thing is happening and will will happen with with other areas. Um, like the ones that we are mentioning here. And the other thing is, is uh, um, how we structure our science institutions and our universities. So uh, I guess that, for example, in, 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 in America, we see that uh, the, we have these uh, departments which, which are very uh, exotic and have these uh, uh, bring together different people and we see that also in in in, in the netherlands for example in the even in the uk um, in portugal for example the departments tend to be more classical and you have the computer science department and the mathematics department and these silos that guido mentioned um, do not help in this in this uh, uh, crossing of, of areas. So we need more dynamic institutions as well that can change these things more easily and, uh, and have the, the enough oxygen to make these changes and to take the risk. Sometimes it is hard for, for some institutions to take the risk because there's too much at stake. So we basically need uh, investments so that these things can, can have uh, a way to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I, I would ask there to ask Alessandra. Uh, you, you really don't, you are on the data side, right? Yeah, uh, well, I would like to, to comment also this, uh, this question. I think that we are in the good, uh, in the good way. Uh, the other point, uh, as Guido and Alito said, that you have this interdisciplinary in the university, but uh, I think that the open science is a very, uh, very strong thing in, in artificial intelligence. Uh, you see, today you have a lot of open data. Uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, models that are available in GitHub. You have uh, the archive system that you have uh, papers. So uh, I think that is much more open than you when you see other domains such as uh, uh, oil industry or automotive industry or other, other kind of industry. So I think that we are in a good way for that. And the other point is that I think that uh, we, if you see, if you look uh, uh, like uh, uh, in the some of 30 or 40 years ago, when numerical methods start, so numerical methods were very specific for engineering. Now you have numerical methods for any kind of science. You have numerical methods for engineering, for ocean science, uh, for, for many kinds of science that use uh, more or less the same numerical, numerical methods. So I think that the machine learning and artificial intelligence will follow the same path and will be uh, like uh, obligatory, uh, obligatory discipline for any, for any kind of, uh, of, uh, of science. So as much as you need to, to learn computation, you have to learn machine learning, like uh, computation tool. Uh, but I think that we are in this path, I think that we are in good way, in good path for that. Very, very good point. So maybe uh, I, I encourage the, the, the audience to, to take the opportunity to ask questions. You can ask hard questions, but this is a very expert panel, but uh, I, I would, Maybe go back to data and a very specific interest, which is air, air data net. So we don't want to, to repeat things. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Of course, air data net will, will, will rely a lot on BSC experience and guidance. Uh, but what can, should, can we do air data net to do differently, not to repeat, but to really add some value to the Atlantic? What would be your thoughts about that? So how can we really facilitate access to data or the, the, other than Copernicus, for example? Does it make sense? Paco? Um, well, it, it, it does, but um, uh, somehow what, 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 is, what is the, uh, the, uh, 
the aspect that you 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 are most interested in in that question because it's very wide yes so how what kind of data and just of course air data net it's not only about data but it's really the first thing is to have data to give access to data and you, you have a lot of people in africa that will say they don't have temperature data for the ocean for example so very basic things that we take for granted mm -hmm. so how can we best serve that how can we best provide data that is already available uh, how, how will we kick start the stuff <laughs> I, I was I was I asked you to to narrow a bit down the question because uh, if if you think of Copernicus for instance the 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 amount of data and the variety of data is huge and Copernicus is a European space program that that includes uh, satellites but also uh, um, other services associated with the use of the satellite data. So uh, access to this data is is a very it's it's a very large question. We 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 are talking of um, uh, satellite observations in uh, many from many different instruments and in many different channels and uh, also model data and uh, observations in situ from uh, the different components of the Earth system. So the the best way to access this is uh, to uh, create a system that allows not to download the data, but to efficiently access the data that uh, that is requested by the user. And uh, you, you were talking about the uh, uh, ocean temperature data for in, in Africa. So obviously nobody in Africa in uh, is, is going to download all the, uh, uh, let's say, sea surface temperature data sets that are available from observations and uh, on uh, real time satellite data and uh, model uh, simulations. Because first, because it's not sens sensible to do this thing. And second, because uh, the, the, uh, in, the local infrastructure that will be required is not scalable. So somehow what is needed is a bridge, is a, a platform where uh, those who are interested in accessing this data can, uh, can make the data selection and can make a pre-processing before they download the indices or the indicators that are relevant to them. Even in that platform, it would be great if they can apply uh, machine learning uh, uh, algorithms and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, even encode their their own uh, solutions if they are, and if they are provided with the appropriate training to do this thing. So we are talking of three different things. So uh, brokerage of the data. So whatever the data are, uh, have a transparent. Uh, access to a catalog of these data. And we are talking of Copernicus, but there is no reason why that data is uh, coming is not coming from other uh, institutions uh, in North America, in uh, Europe, in South America, and in other places. Uh, so uh, this is easier said than done, of course. But uh, so we are having a brokering, uh, the, the need for a brokering uh, uh, of, the, of the data. We need a platform that allows subsetting and processing this data. And that includes the uh, uh, the access to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the well, uh, tools like TensorFlow that uh, could allow people to do uh, efficient analysis of this data. And at the same time, adequate training to first know what these data actually mean and use the platform to do their own computations. So I know that you you opened a, a call for PhD students to work on in in this direction, and it's a it's a very good idea. So it's a it's it's a, it goes in the direction of what Widow was was saying. So we need to train the people who will make this a reality, and that the, the you're you're putting the, uh, the the money in 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 this in this direction, which is a great decision. Uh, but the challenge is huge. It's a really large challenge if uh, we are talking about creating this infra infrastructure that will serve uh, purposes in, uh, in particular, in developing countries. And uh, the training shouldn't be forgotten. And uh, the training not of the, the people who create the platform, but the, the, the training of the users. And the other aspect that uh, Jamie has mentioned uh, a few times already is quality control. So. Quality control of the data uh, is, uh, as I said in my presentation, often underestimated, 
uh, it's uh, understood in a very different way by people who work with satellite data and with people and by people who work with uh, model data. Completely different languages, completely different vocabularies. If you go and look for the uh, quality assurance information of these different data types, you get something that is impossible to understand. And uh, we can't expect the users to make sense out of this. It's not going to happen. And it's going to prevent many things to really come to, to a, 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 good, a, a, a good solution. Sorry, I extended very, myself too very, much. Very good point, Paco. Thank you. Maybe, Jamisa, I don't know if you want to add. I remember that you talked about, for example, citizen science. This is another kind of data that is, has also quality control issues. Or Exactly. Um, and, and I really uh, love what was just mentioned, you know, about making sure that people are trained to actually use the data and um, and, and are able to, to use it for those uh, specific needs. And I think that with NOAA being a, a source of data, you know, our data is open to the public um, through our National Center for Environmental uh, Information. And so um, I think that I would take a, a different spin on it because um, being a, coming from an agency whose mission is to serve the public, I kind of feel like we should be asking the question that you did, you know, what can we do? And so, um, you know, I think as far as Air Data Net um, could help is possibly facilitating different conversations. Um, and that would be, you know, getting a better understanding of exactly what's needed. Um, particularly, you know, right now, we are in the process of planning for future generation uh, satellites that provide, you know, a, a great amount of data, um, particularly over the, the US, you know, our immediate uh, focus areas. But, um, you know, from our geostationary satellites, we cover everything from New Zealand um, to, the, to the West Coast of Africa. And so, you know, we're always looking to better understand what the requirements are um, for, for our products and, and our services. And so being able to facilitate um, giving us the feedback of what is needed, I think is extremely important um, because we are releasing the data, you know, that, that we have um, open to the public. And so, you know, it, it's kind of different for us, I think, but going back to the training aspect, you know, that is also very important because people do need to understand how to use our data and what it is that we are providing and how to um, assimilate that data, you know, for, for their needs and integrate it into their systems. And so that's that's pretty much my take on on how, you know, we can work together. 